Hi folks, welcome to the Epochs of the Lotus Eaters number 43. This is going to be the first in a series, we don't know how many yet, but it'll be a few, on Napoleon Bonaparte and, you know, his rise, his uh, conquests, and then his fall. Uh, and so we thought we'd start with this episode, which is going to be a, a shallow look at the French Revolution. Uh, I say a shallow look because that's at some point going to be something we're going to do a series of podcasts on its own about, because it's fascinating, it's pertinent, uh, and there's a lot to go through. And I ha we happen to be fairly well read on the subject. So um, we're just going to give you a brief introduction because you can't understand why Napoleon occurred as, an, as a phenomenon without understanding the French Revolution. And it's a fascinating thing that will set the stage for what Europe was like uh, before the Napoleonic Wars. So where do we begin? Well, that's a good question. It's such a massive thing. I was yeah. saying just before we started, it's sort of one of those set pieces, just such a massive thing. If you're, if you're a history buff, history nerd, fan of history, mm. you've got to get involved in the French Revolution at some point. You've really got to know it inside out for all sorts of different reasons. Um, you know, like it's up there in my mind as just one of my, again, one of my, among my favourite topics. Mm. Um, you can't really learn enough about it. So where to start, I suppose, just with, um, well, the first thing to know is that the, the, the main events happen in 1789. Mm. But of course, there's many years, decades really before that of, of the run up of like the thought yeah, and all that sort of thing. Yeah, because it, it, it's not something that just emerged out of nowhere. There was literally like a hundred years, in fact, if not more, of what I guess we'll just call the Enlightenment. That was all strands of thought that were embedded in certain uh, political societies, I guess we'll call them, um, that ended up merging together. And, and there was a constant sort of percolation of these ideas. Because in, uh, I guess we'll say monarchical Europe, pre-Enlightenment uh, pre Europe, a lot of society was depoliticized. But people don't in the modern era don't really understand that a lot of society just simply had no avenue to engage in politics because they were specifically locked out of it. And with the Enlightenment came the general politicization of society. And so suddenly people who weren't involved in politics became very, very political mm -hmm. and had some very extreme demands. Uh, and some, it's, it's a remarkable paradigm shift comes out of uh, the Enlightenment mm. against the habitual traditional politics that had, uh, occupied the political scene prior to that. Do you think mm. that's a fair description? Yeah, no, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that the Enlightenment sort of unleashed all sorts of things, good and bad, yes. didn't it? Yeah. Um, there's no way of denying that. Um, there's one thing, I think one of the first things to say is that perhaps sort of the sort of surface level or armchair version, armchair history version of the French Revolution is that the peasants were extremely repressed, were extremely mm. downtrodden, and that they rose up in this tumult of fury mm. uh, to finally seize back. But that's not quite the case. I guess we most historians that, are careful about that. Yeah, we we could call that the revolutionary view of uh, of history. Um, but that there, but there's definitely alternate views. Uh, and it, Burke actually does a a good job in his reflections of pointing out. Well, hang on, France is a really rich, powerful country. If everyone's being so horribly oppressed, like the Turk, how did it become rich and powerful? Right. How did it get so many educated men? You know, how does it end up with an empire? How does it end up? with all of these niceties and has it end up being like the jewel of Europe if it's such a horrible, oppressive place? Like, mm. there's, a, there's a contradiction that they don't... Uh, th because the, the, the judgments that we'll get into, in fact, are almost entirely theoretical about the monarchy and the society of the French at the time. Yeah. Uh, and this is, again, again, another thing that Burke points out is like, well... If your king is such a despot, why is he agreeing to everything you demand? <laughs> yeah. You know, if, you're, if your aristocrats are so oppressive, why is it that I think they're more... I, I, you know, he'd been to France and he'd know, he had mixed in these circles. He'd met the queen before she was beheaded. And he was like, well, yeah, but she's a gentlewoman. All your aristocrats seem noble and decent. And, you know, I'm, and he's, he's, he, he goes to say, look, I'm not saying there are no problems, but this is not nearly as bad as you're making out. Uh, but it, it seems to be uh, almost like a sort of Alinskyite tactic of demonizing to the maximum extent the opposition and saying, well, look, mm. in principle, they're wrong. So in everything, they're wrong. And Burke's just pointing out, well, it's not that bad. you know. So Edmund Burke, probably the most voracious uh, critic of the French Revolution. Yes. Um, he, well, Churchill wrote... Rightly so the, in many ways, in my opinion. 
Churchill wrote the quote, uh, or the, the reign of Louis XVI, because the king is Louis XVI. Yes. Everyone say the, the, the story of the French Revolution and Louis XVI are all wrapped up in one. Yeah. Just, uh, that, before we go on that, just, just very briefly, um, the, thing to, the important thing to remember as well is that uh, I think it was about 100 years before, the, the figure of Louis XIV looms quite large, because Louis yeah, XIV huge. was, uh, yeah, the I am the state, uh, absolute monarch who uh, was something of a tyrant. And during this period, Burke goes to point out, well, look, when you had a strong king, no one was talking about revolution, but it's because of the weakness of Louis XVI and the clemency and the fact that he, he existing in this sort of, you know, enlightenment idea with all these ideas percolating around him, essentially takes on a bunch of them and essentially consents to a lot of them. And this may be one reason he was so weak to the charges because he essentially agreed with many of them. So Louis XIV, when in... Um in the Sylvester Stallone uh, Judge Dredd when he says, I am the law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Louis XIV. Yeah. He, he, I think he literally said, my word is law. Yeah. Simple as that. So it's yeah. complete, complete autocrat. Yeah. And yeah, Louis XVI is not that. He's weak. Yeah. It's not that he's like this tyrant that crushes people no. with an iron fist. It's the, it's the opposite. He's too weak. He agrees to almost um, everything the revolutionaries demand until they can't demand any more than his head. Um, anyway. Churchill says, Spoilers. quote, France in the reign of Louis XVI was by no means the most oppressive, uh, oppressively governed in Europe, uh, he says, uh, French political machinery in no way expressed the people's will. Um, it did not match the times and could not move with them. So one of the things I want to say is that Louis XIV spent all the money. Mm. <laughs> mm. He spent all the money that France mm. had. Um, and then uh, he had a very long reign, sort of over 70 years. But then Louis XV also had quite a long reign. Um, uh he, he things really needed to be addressed in the reign of Louis the Fifteenth, and they just weren't for like a whole generation now, nearly two generations really. Uh, things were just allowed to slide, and so by the time Louis the Sixteenth comes in, again, he's quite a relatively young man. Um, he, he inherits a, a dodgy, dicey situation. Mm. Things are uh, it could go one way or another, could break one way or another. Um, but if I could read one ever so slightly longer quote by Churchill here, he yeah. wrote, uh, quote, In Europe, the impulse towards liberty, equality and popular sovereignty uh, had to come from elsewhere. It came from France. The English Revolution had been entirely a domestic affair. So too, in the main, had the American. But the French Revolution was to spread out from Paris across the whole continent. It gave rise to a generation of warfare and, it, and its echoes reverberated long into the 19th century and afterwards. Every great popular and national movement until the Bolsheviks gave a fresh turn to events in 1917 was to invoke the principles set forth at Versailles in 1789. Yeah, and you, you can see this in like many like d d communist revolutionaries often sing, uh, what's the French song? The, the Messiah. That's it. Yeah, they they often sing that as well, and it's just like right. Okay, that's very interesting to see the ancestry of these ideas. But like the, this, this is in every domain of life as well. Where it says the impulse towards liberty, equality, and popular sovereignty. Like I, I recall, um, I think it was under the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, where his like you know, Chancellor of the Exchequer or equivalent office was basically going to the merchants and saying, well, look, what can the state do to help you? And this is where the term laissez-faire came along. So it was like, leave us alone. Just let us get mm. on with it. Mm. And this this whole, and and because at the time, uh, I can't remember what I was reading. I was reading something a, 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 probably a couple of years ago now, but I found this fascinating because it was just like, um, the, the at the time, a state's power was um, considered to be contained in its wealth. You know, how much money a state had within it was uh, an indication of its power. And Adam Smith was just like, but that's not how economy, economics works. And this is one of the arguments that Adam Smith ends up winning, basically, with uh, the, the contemporaries of the time. Um, and so, but you, you can see how, like, all of these strands start coming together to form what we consider now to be liberalism, like economic free trade, political rights, democracy, all those sorts of things. They're, they're all strands of thought that exist at this time and are jostling with the monarchical... Um, strands of thought as well. You can see it in like Locke's argument with Robert Filmer over his patriarcha. It's like, where does legitimate gov governance lie? And Filmer's like, well, it's in the father, surely. And he makes the argument that essentially that Locke just extrapolates to being like, well, you're saying that Adam is the king of all men because he's the first man and therefore the father of the entire human race. And that doesn't make any sense because I'm not actually the the absolute despot of my own sons. So what, what are you talking about? You know, and it, it, he is right in, you know, the, these are ridiculous arguments now um, but again, at the time, these held weight because people were religious. People believed in the worldview and the structure of 
the way things were. And and anyway, so you can see it's like it's like a, a very broad spectrum where essentially reason arises to critique the entire civilization. You know, mm. the entire European civilization uh, gets put on the chopping block. And as Churchill points out, it's probably England's fault. Wow. Because um, we we started with uh, revolutions that weren't really revolutions. And the French didn't really understand our revolutions. And because of the time, the, the idea of reason being, uh, and it, it, I think it comes from Bacon, whereas to use uh, reason for the uh, relief of man's estate. This is the sort of driving teleology of the Enlightenment. And, okay, well, the aristocracy are pressing me. You know, I can use reason for the relief of my state. Well, how are the aristocracy justified? And this wasn't taken to its full apex in England. Uh, the English being um, stupid, as Burke puts it, uh, didn't really think it through. And they just wanted to be left, you know, they, they just wanted, and exactly, uh, in fact, as Churchill points out, these domestic affairs, this is why we did a, a little thing where I was going through all of the... Uh, constitutional manuscripts that the english have in the history and it's just like ancient customs and liberties ancient customs and liberties it's not about creating anything new it's about restoring what was felt to have been lost but if you're french and you don't have the rights of englishmen uh what you have done and this is what john locke does is extract the rights of englishmen into an abstract crib as michael oakshot would put it as the rights of men it's like, no, these are not the rights of men. These are the political rights of Englishmen that are hereditary from ancient times as the English have preserved them. And when the foreigners get hold of them, they don't know that and they don't have that. And so this becomes the rights of man and it kind of goes off the rails mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you make of that? Yeah, thesis? so, um, yeah, no, it's all very interesting. I think, um, well, so two important figures uh, we're told by all the historians mm. for the mind of the Frenchman in the late 18th century, were Voltaire and Rousseau. Oh, yeah. And uh, they're very, very different men. Uh, their writings are very different. Um, but but they both absolutely ridiculed um, uh, organised religion, mm. um, the idea of kings yep. and aristocracy and all that sort of thing, that you should question uh, the ancien regime. Um, uh, but they did it in very, very different ways, um, mm. and they argued with each other and things. But one thing I did want to say about that is that they both died about 10 years before yeah. the French Revolution. So they existed in the mind of the revolutionaries um, as like these past masters in a way. Almost and, like prophets. Uh, yeah. Honestly. And, I, I, Rousseau, like you see the way that um, Marat and Robespierre talk about Rousseau and they, they, they're talking about him like he's Mohammed. Apparently Robespierre kept a copy of the social contract on him at all times. Yeah. So And Marat used to stand on the street preaching it like standing on street corners preaching the social contract. And then then they had his ashes interred in the Pantheon, didn't they, <laughs> as well? So it's just like, right, so what are you talking about? This is like your Mecca? This is your Muhammad? You know, they, they he sounds very much like a prophet to them. Mm. And, uh, and what I find interesting as well is that both Voltaire and Rousseau seem to be generally envious of English politics. Like, the, there, are, there are many points, especially in Rousseau, where he is essentially um, admiring the English for their political system. Uh, by not fully understanding it, as Burke goes at lengths to point out, um, like actually, no, the English didn't. Did, you know, we we didn't design this. You know, but you just wish you had what we had, uh, but you can't reason yourself into having what we had because, you know, we're a dull and sluggish race, and we just carried on through our prejudices. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, I think this uh, this is the idea of um, romanticism versus reason. Oh yeah, and the Enlightenment is really sort of the birth of romanticism in some ways. Yeah. Um, or or yeah. also the Renaissance is the rebirth of classicism mm. um, and the abandonment of medieval things. Oh, um, that, sorry, just a great point there as well. Um, because this, this I, I was listening to a series of lectures by some professor about the French Revolution a few months back. And one of the things that she pointed out was that, look, uh, you know, a generation or two prior to the French Revolution, essentially uh, after, like post Renaissance, the the French um, gent gentry, I guess we'll call them, not just the aristocracy, but like anyone well to do, who went to a half decent school, uh, was just subsumed in classicism. Uh, so you know they were they were taught about you know Julius Caesar and the Roman Republic, ancient Athens, ancient Sparta, and Rousseau comments on these at length. You know saying oh well they're brilliant all the time. Um, and so you can see how, like, 
republicanism is being brought into the culture through the education of the children because this is like the the new intellectual fad right and it's just it, in much the same way that like pronouns and wokeism <laughs> is being done to our children now this new intellectual fad is put into the minds of the youth and then they grow up to be the men of the state and so they're constantly it, it's it's literally like a shibboleth it's to say well look i'm in the club because i was educated in the classics and therefore i'll tell you about cicero and caesar and brutus and whatnot and this is how they know they're talking to one another mm. Mm. Well, I mean, Rousseau wrote, he didn't, it's the most famous one is The Social Contract, but he yeah. wrote all sorts of novels, oh, yeah. all sorts of treatises on yeah. things. One of them was Emile, and in Emile, he talks about how you should raise children correctly. And I haven't actually read Emile yet. Uh, yeah. I bet, um, it's, I bet it's amazing. It's weird, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's really weird. <clears throat> well, the, there's this idea that in the medieval or ancient time, you look upon children as essentially bad, right? Mm -hmm. Children are essentially evil really in some way and you have to force them to be good yes or at the very best they're a blank slate and you have to teach them to be good yes. okay uh russo says no children are essentially uh perfect they're essentially <laughs> nice and great and uh, yeah. noble of spirit and yeah. it's only the modern world the evilness of yeah. the world of men that yeah. corrupts them and makes them bad yeah well i, uh, I disagree with yeah. that hobbes uh, yeah. was right about children yeah and I, dis man, I disagree with that um and but the idea the uh, Rousseau is sort of uh, one of the great examples, one of the really early romantics. So it might be a bit difficult for us in the 21st century world to sort of get our minds around this a bit, but in sort of a pre-modern, well, it's not pre-modern, but sort of mostly unindustrialized world still in the late mm. 18th century, certainly in France, um, the idea that returning to nature is the correct thing to do. He looked at, Rousseau looked at the way uh, Europeans had gone over to the new world mm and how European culture or whatever had essentially, in all sorts of ways, corrupted and destroyed the, the perfect native peoples that were already there. Yeah. They, um, they also, they, the, what I guess we can just generally call the social contract theorists, so like Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and a few others, uh, they also laboured under a view of the state of nature that was obviously not true and never existed. And Rousseau even admits this in his Discourse on Inequality. It's like, look, this is probably not how it happened. But uh, essentially, they believe that man was atomized individuals running around in the woods, uh, never wanting for anything. I mean, like you've got the, the Hobbesian and Rousseauian view, which is directly at odds, where Hobbes is like, look, man roamed the woods in isolation and his existence was nasty, brutish, and short. Which, if a man was roaming the woods, that would be an accurate description of his existence. You know, it would be a hard, harrowing experience. But Rousseau instead paints it like man is in the Garden of Eden. Just like eating oaks under an oak tree and then making his uh, bed in the boughs and, <laughs> you know, just, just frolicking through nature. And it's like, no, that's not how it would be. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't like that. But if it was like that, that's not how it would be. Rousseau is an unbelievable idealist when it comes mm -hmm. to this. Uh, and, and frankly, ridiculous. Yeah, the idea of sort of a noble savage. Um, and it's only the, the, the world of kings and priests uh, that that destroys that perfectness. Well, that's the that's Rousseau's contention actually in in the discourse and in the social contract, which follows afterwards, mm -hmm. is that well, look, man only has one virtue in the state of nature, it, and so he he begins by saying, well, men have no virtues or vices because all of these things are the products of civilization. So he 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 wouldn't have any contact with any other humans really, apart from women to breed whenever they came across each other, uh, and so he'd just be wandering around doing as he pleased, eating you know, fighting with the animals, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Obvious nonsense. Mm. Um, but then when men decided to come together in tribes for convenience, but why would he be doing that if he had everything that he needed? Rousseau never explains. Uh, and well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do a big thing about Rousseau savage at some point, because it's a fascinating concept that's so obviously wrong, but it's why the social contract exists. He's trying to return us to that state of nature within society, which is why everything's going so horribly wrong and why leftists today are his direct intellectual descendants. But he, um, he, he's, he's got this idea that basically when men start coming together, then they become dependent on one another. And that's where bonds of obligation begin cr to be created. And that's how society begins corrupting each other. That's where vices and virtues and evil and deceit and duplicity and all that sort of thing can actually begin to come into human affairs. And that's how society is the corrupting force. The, the, that's the origin of vices comes from society. Because in the state of nature, man has no virtues or vices except for one virtue. He credits him with one virtue alone, and that's pity. Pity for his fellow man is that, well, look, when I see a, a dead person, I'm like, oh, that's a shame. That it's like, 
I've, I've seen plenty of people who don't think that, you know, <laughs> who are essentially living in your state of nature, you know, mm. like, so it, I, it, but again, this is the optimism of Rousseau compared to the pessimism of Hobbes and Hobbes was just right. You know, it would have been a horrible suffering, rough existence where you're hungry mm. and savage. And if someone else had killed a deer, you'd go and kill them to take that deer, you know? Yeah. So you, I suppose you could call Rousseau's philosophy regressive in a way. He's sort of anti-progress. Well, unbelievably so. Like, right. I mean, he's got a, a one part in the social contract in part two where he's just like it was. It was I uh, know in, in the discourse where he was saying that the first man who staked out a patch of ground uh, and said this is mine uh, was the first charlatan, and right. all around yeah. him should have said no, don't listen to this charlatan. Tear up his stakes, fill in his ditches. You know, the earth is for everyone, and the fruits of it are for everyone. And it's like, right, okay, so he's like a proto-communist. Like, this is the, the, the origin point of the communist thought. So one thing I just want to say real quick, just to bring back to the man, Rousseau, he grew up in a small village just outside Geneva. Yep. And at some point when he was a small child, his father got into some sort of legal money problems and they had to flee and they went to Paris. Um, but So ever since then, he looked back on this sort of idyllic, yeah. literally childlike view mm. he had of this small community where everyone was uh, worked together but was a sort of self-sufficient. Yeah. These really small communities where you don't necessarily need uh, a priest or a king or anything to work. Yeah. But it only works in that very well, specific type way. And anyway, he looked back on that saying, why can't the whole world be like this? Yeah, we'll uh, all be happy. We'll all be yeah. brothers, a fraternity. All yeah, that sort no, of thing. no, absolutely. And and you can you can very much tell after spending any time studying the social contract that he's talking. I mean, it's dedicated, uh, not the social contract, but the discourse on inequality is dedicated to the, uh, the, the sovereign lords of Geneva. And he's got this obsequious note at the beginning saying, basically, please love this. Uh, <laughs> I, I I don't know how the discourse was taken, but the social contract was burned by the Lords of Geneva and banned, and he was exiled. Uh, and he had to. It's subversive even now, let alone then, it's, right? Yeah, I exactly. mean, um... it's unbelievably radical. <laughs> um, and he had to flee to England, uh, like all of the radicals from the continent tend to do. I think one of the key things in Rousseau is his concept of the general will. Yes, because that's what if we're going to tie it into the the if someone like Robespierre sort of carried a copy of the social contract yeah. around him at all times. Yeah. Arguably, um, the idea of the, the general will is key. Um, so and the, it's that you can justify doing anything as long as it's in the yeah in the, the general will. So the, 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 the general will is um, kind of like Schrodinger's cat. Uh, you only discover it after a vote. <laughs> Right. The, 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 and it is th is through the mechanism of the general will that all kings are rendered illegitimate, right? And it's because of the way he constructs the general will. So the, the general will is the uh, aggregate will of every person in the society uh, that has an unfallible bearing on the, the common interests of the entire civilization, right? And so that can only be discovered by a vote, as in... The, the people, uh, the, the, they express the general will in their electoral uh, politics. And this is uh, the origin of sovereignty as well. And so this collective and united will of all of the members of the community can only be discovered by a vote. And it can never be wrong. And so essentially what he says is, uh, look, if, if you, uh, say, take the Brexit vote, right, um, the general will of the Brexit vote was to leave the European Union. And the Remainers were wrong. It's not that they right. have their opinion. It's that they will. They when you vote, you're trying to divine what the general will is. Mm -hmm. And if you if you're on the wrong side of the vote, you must change your opinion. You must change your position. You must say to yourself, "Oh, well, I was not in accordance with the general will. Therefore, I was misinformed." And he specifically mm -hmm. says that the people themselves are essentially deceived. Right now, I mean, I'm happy to go with that in the case of the Brexit vote. The Remainers were deceived, mm -hmm. uh, but the. Uh, it's not that they just merely had a different opinion uh, because of their particular wills. Um, their particular wills were not aligned with the compass of the general will because uh, the general will is this sort of metaphysical abstract that can mm. only be discovered by the vote. Mm. It's not decided by the vote because that's how we would say the common opinion you know, of the, of the democracy is decided by a vote. No, no, no. It already exists in potential somewhere and it's discovered by the act of the vote. Like mm. Schrodinger's cat, the act of looking at the mm. box. Mm. Oh, now it's dead. It was indeterminate before that, right? <laughs> um, and this this is the the perfect infallible will. It can never be wrong. He literally states this. Mm. Uh, it can never be alienated, and it's 
the thing that renders every monarch illegitimate. Because the monarch himself has a particular will, of course, and that particular will may not be in line with the general will. And in fact, he uh, he says that the particular will of the monarch will, quote, act incessantly against the general will. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's in the general will that sovereignty lies. And so if the monarch has a particular will that's acting against the general will, well, the sovereignty lies in the general will itself, which is the aggregate will. That's quite radical, isn't it, saying it it's lies a, with that, not with the king? Well, that's... Uh, <laughs> uh, but the thing is, you can see how he's taken this from England, where we do have the idea that actually it is the people. We've got a constitutional monarchy yeah, ex- by then. Exactly. And, and, and in England, we've got a, a relational... And I'm sure they did in France at the time as well. But we, we have like a relational view where the king is obligated to the people you know there's there's obligation there and you know the the king's meant to be the people's champion you know um but anyway he says that the um quote it must happen sooner or later that the prince at length oppresses the sovereign which is the general will the the sovereign will and violates the social treaty and therefore the, the social contract is broken and once this usurpation has happened the social compact is broken the citizens return to a state of nature and not morally bound to obey so the it, and it said, in, it must ha- it must happen sooner or later that the prince breaks the social contract, right? So this renders every monarch illegitimate. It will, by necessity, mean that the monarch is acting against the general will. The general will is being the the sovereignty is being violated. The social contract is broken. Therefore, all kings are illegitimate. Hmm. That's Rousseau's opinion. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.